Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Oh god, it's such a great day. Raiding Royals with David Mitchell and Dan Snow. Maybe my two favorite British people right here. I don't know for sure. But uh, this came out two hours ago. I am very happy. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. History hit. The link to the original video, top of the description as always. Below that, link to the Discord if you want to join. Makes it easier for me to interact with you, see your recommendations. Let's get started. Let's go. Bastards. My name's Connor, if you're new. Learning time. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Oh, Macus. Let's go. I, I haven't said that in a while. I used to always say that. There's the door. You're in the wrong They're class. all right, bastards, basically. The standard of conduct is woefully below what we'd expect, you know, <laughs> uh, even of Hollywood. What you have to do, you have to be horrible. They were all horrible. You have to be willing to kill at a moment's notice. I'm not keen on William the Conqueror, and I'm not keen on Edward the Confessor. I th certainly feel that if they swapped roles, they'd both be very unhappy. <laughs> With David Mitchell. To what do we owe this great treat? Why are you a, a colossus <laughs> delving into our little world of history? What's going on? I wrote this, I started writing this book during the, during the lockdown when a lot of people are trying to write things and I ha hadn't been and then I started typing about the Vikings oh, brilliant. Uh, because uh, I, it's, it occurred to me that Covid is a bit like the Vikings in that it was a terrible thing that suddenly happened to an unsuspecting uh, community in, in the case of my typing Anglo-Saxon England and suddenly they were, they were being Anglo-Saxon England in their way and it wasn't of great life but you know they were used to it and then suddenly the Vikings turned up and it was grim and they did guys did Vikings oh well I guess so there were, were there any Norman invasions that the Romans had to deal with when they were conquering Britain or did it just go or did it just happen when Roman and Roman influence in Britain 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 left and then so they could or didn't know why they didn't know whether they'd stop turning up whether they'd go away and just thought that's that's the one of the bleakest things about being a human being sometimes a bit of history just happens to you and there's nothing you can do and you're a victim of it and you're not part of it and you don't have agency and the anglo-saxons as we did tried to give themselves some agency by saying it was their fault and you know, have all the talk about uh, yes, with um, COVID, we haven't been preparing enough for pandemics, or that somebody may be at a bat, or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Let's please, as humanity, let's take ownership of it and make it something we've done to ourselves, rather than the more frightening thing, which is just something that's happening to us that has nothing to do with us and makes us not a villain but just a victim. And that's that's what happened with the, with the Vikings turning and the Anglo-Saxons said, "Oh, it's God's cross with us. We haven't been praying enough. We haven't been holy enough." It, that wasn't why. It just imagine like thinking that like God is focused, like it, whatever God there is focused on you, and everyone else is just a tool to torture you. It, it's such a crazy. It's crazy how people would have themselves believe that rather than just like not know the cause it was just because we haven't been praying enough we haven't been holy enough it, that wasn't why it was just because that you know the socio-economic conditions in scandinavia shifted slightly as did uh maritime, maritime technology yeah, mate, yeah we can't can't control yeah, the waters around the island david as yeah. we know you know that's yeah. the ongoing uh, problem in british history so you now, it used to be vikings now it's sewage that's <laughs> good point <laughs> Uh, then they try. I've got images now of the monks on Lindisfarne attempting to sort of enforce social distancing. <laughs> Sorry, can yeah. you just? Well, it's the ultimate social distancing, just going to Lindisfarne, isn't it? I mean, uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why kings and queens? What, why do we return? It's so interesting. We, we return time and again to this. Does it give us this? What, does it give us a track and narrative that we can then write, that, hang on the best rest of British history onto? I think so. I think. Yeah, I think that. For me, certainly in the medieval period. Uh, I think they sort of act as a good, like, chapter beginning point, as you can point to and to narrow down certain section of history you want to talk, you want to talk about. History on to. I think so. I think f for me, certainly in the medieval period, that the, my 
book's about. That's the basic political narrative, the who's in charge narrative. And that doesn't tell the full story, but it tells one of the main stories and it has a and it and it leads you through it you know in many ways there probably there are more important things to look at in terms of the lives of the majority of the people but in terms of characters and story that's what i was drawn to and you can't also one of the reasons my book ends in 1603 and one of the reasons is that after that if you just talk about the kings and queens that becomes less and less relevant and that stops being even the main political story after a hundred years or so. I think that's that's so true because if we're in this poll, we're going to try and just talk about a little, trying to get a bit of a pecking order going. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's so hard to compare medieval monarchs uh, yeah. with with early modern and modern ones because you end up having to like go, well, is Elizabeth, was Elizabeth II better than Athelstan? And you're like, they are. It is just <laughs> you're comparing two totally different yeah. entities, aren't you? Yeah, but 1603. I, I understand if you want to say like Queen Elizabeth is. How is 1603? The cutoff. Obviously, you can't compare Elizabeth II to. I just, so I hope they go into why 1603. I mean, like, Am I not paying just, attention? You're comparing two totally different <laughs> entities, aren't you? I certainly feel that if they swapped roles, they'd both be very unhappy. <laughs> I think if Elizabeth II was trying to consolidate Anglo-Saxon control on a partly Viking-occupied island, I, I don't. I don't think that would have been her great strength. You wouldn't like a little I think he might have found it a bit frustrating. The the endless duty and positivity, and he might just can at some point can I slash someone to bits with a sword. Go, no, Your Majesty. Just now, take the pose those, of your flowers and smile. <laughs> those days are <laughs> over. Whenever I write and think about kings and queens, this our bizarre habit of starting the king list with William the Conqueror. It just is so strange, isn't it? And you've gone yeah. all the way back to the early medieval as yeah. well, haven't you? Well, I thought if we're going to define a book, one of the ways you could define it is say it's about the kings and queens of England. And so you immediately say, OK, so England has to exist. And England didn't exist. I mean, obviously the physical space did, but no one called it England before the Anglo-Saxons arrived because that term derives from then. So we can forget about the Romans. And similarly, after Elizabeth I, you got the same. Sorry, the terms like these still confuse me and I haven't yet. There are two big things I I really want to um like memorize. And it's, um oh my God. From then. So no one called it England before the Anglo-Saxons. And similarly. Oh yes, I remember. It's one of them is like the the Picts, the the um the Picts, the Celts, the Gauls, no, like uh, all of these certain words uh, names of the listen, all right. Also, military group sizes, like what is a battalion versus a a platoon versus a it's kind of not, I'm getting off topic. They're just two things that come up in videos that I'm like, I still haven't memorized what those mean and would help me so they much. Are because that term derives from then. So we can forget about the Romans. And similarly, after Elizabeth I, you got the same monarchy in charge of England and Scotland. And so it starts to be more Britain. But the, the big problem we all face, isn't it? Is who was the first king of England? Yes. It's a well, nightmare. Well, it, it might be Athelstan. Yeah. It might be Edward the Elder. It's not Alfred the Great. Sadly not. Um, but it's around then. As yeah. I say in the book, it's a sort of soft launch, the Kingdom <laughs> of England. Because um, the Anglos, before the Vikings came, the Anglo-Saxons definitely had lots of different kingdoms and a vague sense that they're from the same cultural root, but no real sense that the notion of England is really forged on the, on the, in opposition to the, the Vikings. Were well, you kind of drawn towards what do you define as a king? What, what do you define as that's not a king yet? And what do you define as England? And then that'll be the answer. Right? Those early on the, in opposition to the, the Vikings. It seems like there's less about disagreement on who's the king and what should qualify the first king to be. I kind guess. of drawn towards those early monarchs. I find them increasingly interesting, cause I, only because we overlooked them until quite recently. They just weren't part of our kind of national story. In, it's, in it's all, it's, I, I like it because it's so confusing. Definitely. You know, that, that the, and you understand why there's been so much televising of the Tudors, because it's you sort of know where you are. There's, sort right. of, there's a handful of easy characters to get a... Get a grip you can on. assume a bit of knowledge in the audience. Yeah. Everyone knows where they are. But yeah. the Wars of the Roses, 
it's all over the place, you know, and I, you know, I, I, even since writing the book, I've... I took a seminar class called Tutors. Shoot me. Shoot me right now. I will jump out that window before I take that class again. I am not, you, you cannot make me. Forgotten most of it. Okay, but great. Plantagenet going into the... Plantagenet, Carolingian, Carolian, Carolingian, um, Merovingian, Aquitanian, Aquitanian. All of these terms I need to memorize. It's in the book, I've forgotten most of it. Okay, but great. But Plantagenet, I, I, even but the Wars of the Roses, it's all over the place, you know. And I, you know, I, I even since writing the book, I've forgotten most of it. Okay, but great. But Plantagenet going into the two cadet branches of ha of York and Lancaster, that that that's that's the big muddle of what basically happened in medieval England that I used writing this book. Oh my God, I'm going back. Stop. I'm still thinking about Tudor. And it was a seminar class, which means you had it once a week, but it was three hours long. Okay. Place. You Sorry. Know, and I, you know, I, I, even since writing the book, I've forgotten most of it. Okay, but great. But Plantagenet going into the two cadet branches of, ha of York and Lancaster, that, that, that's, that's the big muddle of what basically happened in medieval England that I used writing this book to briefly get a sort of grip on. Um, but the, yeah, the confusingness of it is, it, and the, is attractive. And, and, the, the, and that's what all kingship is. Our notion of kings is partly Henry VIII, but apart from the, his big iconic figure, we're thinking of kings that were in that period. That, that's the proper period of kings. That's when the, the, um, all of the, the aesthetic of kingship derives from that time. They had crowns, they had shields, yeah. they had coats of arms. And, and that's what, and they all, all of the pictures of um, King Arthur have him like that, even though if he had existed, which he didn't, he, he, he was a, a millennium yeah, earlier yeah. and would have had very, very different clobber. Probably, so probably a bit of an old toga, you know. Yeah, and clinging half, on to the half remnants a, of... Half a gladius and a, and a sandal. Is writing a history book sort of dad... Is that one of the dad sort of things to tick off? You know, like it's dad life, hashtag dad life. <laughs> I, guess, I mean, the reason I ask you about writing history books, it strikes me that one of your more famous alter egos, someone who, someone who you had to struggle in the past to put distance between you and this fictional person, um, he wanted to write a book called Business Secrets of the Pharaohs, I think. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, look, I can't say that I've entirely escaped the shadow of Mark Corrigan in writing a history book. This, this is a book that he might be interested in. Well, I think so. But, that, that's the, he, but the thing is that, that him and me, that we're, we were young fogies, and now yeah. I'm gradually growing into the appropriate age for fogies. That's, as another young fogie, yeah. it's quite nice that all your friends suddenly join you. You don't move. You, you remain as interested in Stalingrad yeah. as you were at 19. Yeah. But strangely, your sort of weird mates who are interested in, like, house music and other things start to... And then yeah. sometimes it surpassed you. Like, I've got mates now like writing detailed descriptions. Their grandfather at the Battle of Passchendaele. I'm like, you have gone, you've gone, yeah. you've overshot the runway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what's your music collection looking like yeah, now? Exactly, yeah. exactly. I love that people's different perspectives on all the monarchs. Can we just start with, like, any that you are just sick of and you think are massively overrated? I'm not keen Conqueror. on William the Conqueror. Okay. Um, I'm not keen on William the Conqueror and I'm not keen on Edward the Confessor. Well, I wouldn't say Edward the Confessor is massively overrated, but no one we, likes him. we call him. Well, I'm very glad to hear oh, it, because it seems like lots of people like him. They allow him to call himself Edward the Confessor and talk about his holiness and his praying. Absolutely useless man. He was a useless man. Totally. Wow, that is a very... I never thought of it about, about it that way, but that is kind of a self-righteous sort of name. Like, okay, dude, I... All right. He's talking about his holiness and his praying. Absolutely useless man. He was a useless man. Totally. He sowed the seeds of discord. Absolutely. Do we not like William the Conqueror? Because Say you it have to a his face. <laughs> sowed the seeds of discord. Absolutely. Do we not like William the Conqueror? Because you have a kind of nostalgic love for the Anglo-Saxon, sort of all a bit 19th century, a bit nostalgic lucky. for that. Or do you just think that he was a white right bastard who um, was uh, just a, a violent psychopath? Well, they were all right bastards, basically, in terms of the, the standard of conduct is 
woefully below <laughs> what we'd expect, you know, uh, even of Hollywood. There were so many times in the Middle Ages where people were just waiting for the, this this useless bastard to die. And then and occasion, very occasionally they go, well, it could be age, even though it's the Middle Ages and people just drop dead for no reason all the time. We, we just can't <laughs> wait for him to die. We Guys, sorry, I think my camera's about to... I see it's fine. I thought it was going to fall. And now I'm in frame. Yes. Sorry. Gonna drop dead for no reason all the time. We we just can't <laughs> wait for him to die. We're gonna have to do true. something else. Edward the Second. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just too long. Just... He might not die for thirty years. Yeah, we can't. Uh, his father made old yeah, bones. Yeah, dad made old yeah. bones, and, and his son did all. Yeah, Richard the Second. Similarly, yeah. it's, it's going to be too long before he dies. We're just going to have to put him in a castle and starve him. So the, the Richards are the one with the funny kind of like what you'd call like a Karen haircut kind of thing. Like, the funny, like, brown hair, like, down to here, sort of, uh, Lord Farquaad, the sh from Shrek. Like, that that's, like, a Richard era haircut. I don't know if that was, like, the 1400s or... William the Conqueror, yeah. you don't like him because you're, well, you're affectionate. Well, you've got to pick a side, right? Okay, I, I okay. mean, that may be that some academic historians would say you don't. I think possibly. But, but I think they've lost, <laughs> they've lost the joy. Uh, but I think... If, Battle of Hastings, one of the first things you get taught about, or I got taught about, and you, you've got to pick a side. Do you want to pick the invading Normans, or do you want to pick the Harold sitting on Senlac Hill? And I picked Harold. Most of the people in my class picked Harold. But turns out, sadly, <laughs> uh, spoil Sorry. Well, I got taught about. I got to pay attention. I'm, I'm ADD, like, think. <laughs> uh, but I think the Battle of Hastings, one of the first things you get taught about, or I got taught about, and you can... You've got to pick a side. Do you want to pick the invading Normans or do you want to pick the Harold sitting on Senlac Hill? And I picked Harold. Most of the people in my class picked Harold. But turns out, sadly, <laughs> uh, spoiler alert for people who haven't yet bought the book, Harold loses. Crikey. And Wait, so they... Oh, my... And I heard this thing yeah. is huge, Michael. Um, sorry. Uh, the... Now that's a bit of a... Oh my god. I got distracted by the horse again. Yeah, the book. Harold Luke. Oh yeah, so like when they're teaching you about this as a young kid that like you genuinely don't know, like they ask you who's going to win. This is crikey. And that's, you know, that's a bit of a shame. And it's one of the good reasons not to start uh, your history of the kings and queens of England with uh, William the Conqueror because it's a it's a bit of a pisser. <laughs> Down. Yeah. Harold's an attractive character, I think. Yeah, he's course, he's yeah. very obviously had no uh, birthright to be king, but that we we feel more relaxed about that now that we're not so keen on the whole notion of people being in charge because of a birthright. Uh, but he was he was professional. He was organised. He he was he did he did everything right. Uh, except, and it, and he would have won the Battle of Hastings if, if not his, for going up north first. His army had listened to him. And his Dang it! I gotta shut up. I'm trying to be then smart. He would have won the Battle of Hastings if his army had listened to him. And his brother Tostig was obviously such a horrible person. Yeah. Harold got rid of him. I, yeah, I, I... We all know families can be difficult, and I you, I feel for Harold trying to deal with Tostig. And he initially he has he's got a nice earldom in the north. Things are going nicely for him, but he pushes his luck. And, you know, and, and I think Harold deals with it with great, great dignity. So you're a Harold fan. Yeah. Uh, you are not a William fan. Anyone else overrated? Uh, I think the Tudors in general overrated. are overrated because they're not... And the, the, their imagery is great. The portraits of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I in particular, that's, that's great iconography. But they're a bit of an afterthought. For, of medieval kingship, really, and it's and I, and I think in their time, England is essentially accepting its own mediocrity. Henry VIII, it's got to be said, he's been overcovered, but he is a lot of fun. I understand why he's had so much coverage, and in a way, looked at in terms of if you, if you take the job of a king not to be to rule his own age, but to give lots of interesting stories to Great posterity. He, he has been an amazing content provider, and, and I do accept that he's fun, but I've had a bit of enough of him. And, and also, if you think about him for more than five minutes, he was, ob he was so 
awful and unbearable. Yeah. You know, he almost seemed rather a complete tyrant. But the fact that he had a, a sort of an intelligent, thoughtful, intellectual side to him almost makes his uh, his tantrums and his uh, crushing insecurity yeah all the more uh, contemptible. So you're a blood and thunder guy. I mean, you're a you like you like a king. What was it, Henry the? Fourth of Navarre and of France said, I, "You know, I rule with my arse in my saddle and my sword in my hand." That, that's your archetype. Well that, well, that was the way to do it. That, that's what Henry II did, and he's one of the most effective medieval monarchs, albeit one who sort of met with a sad, lonely end. Yeah. Henry the First was great, and he's a professional. I, I like it. I agree. He, he, he got yeah. rid of his brothers. Yeah. And he, he, he usurped the throne. Yeah. Brutally. Which is, you well, know. no, there was a terribly unfortunate hunting accident in the New Forest where poor Prince Harry saw his older brother William <laughs> get, get killed very accidentally and not on purpose at all. That's... Well, he definitely bounced back quickly from his grief <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, did what... Uh... These people are so intelligent in what they're talking about that, like, there are some little things I can be like, ooh, I know what they're talking about, and then, like, oh, yeah, I'm basically a monkey to them. And got in ahead of his poor, the elder brother. I mean, oh, what a one life. Of one of life's losers. Got in ahead of his poor, the elder brother. I mean, oh, what a one life. Of life's, one of life's losers. Yeah, one, one uh, of history's losers. Robert yeah. Curtos, who, yeah. who died, he was made very old bones, but spent most of his life in Cardiff Castle. Yeah. Um, what, what, that's the second, what do you mean made old, very old bones? That's voice crack. That, that's the second time they've said bones, that. But spent most of his life in Cardiff Castle. Um, and, you know, Cardiff wasn't the vibrant centre then that it is now. <laughs> so, I, you know, I feel, uh, feel sorry for him. But no, Henry I, he was just, it just, just feels like he's professionally got it. What you have to do, you have to be horrible. They were all horrible. You have to be willing to kill at a moment's notice. But if you do it with a rationale, you do it even-handedly, you don't have favourites and you have some notion of the stable government you want to be heading towards, then then it can work out. And he created a very peaceful kingdom. What, what did he mean by that? You, they were all, it, just, it just, just feels like he's professionally got it. What you have to do, you have to be horrible over him. But no, Henry I, he was just, it just, just feels like he's professionally got it. What you have to do, you have to be horrible. They were all horrible. You have to be willing to kill at a moment's notice. But if you do it, with a rationale, you do it even-handedly, you don't have favourites, and you have some notion of the stable government you want to be heading okay. towards, then, then it can work out. And he created a very peaceful kingdom. So, in other words, if you don't look like a guy who just really wants power and wants to be king so he can be in charge and just kill someone to get there, if you don't do that and have some sort of a plan, a visible you know, idea of what's going on in the government to your people, it can work out. Okay. Albeit through violence. And and in those days, that's sort of as good as it, it is, gets. It and also, another thing he doesn't do, that many of the other ones that vie for best king, they all do do, is he didn't try and conquer too many other places. That puts a lot of pressure on the kingdom. When the hundreds of years where every king of England is trying also to be king of France, and it's not really viable. But he said, no, I've got Normandy and England, yeah, great. and I'm going to stick. Happy days. Yeah. OK, so Tudor's overrated, William the Conqueror's overrated. Anybody else that you, you, you came to really think was... So can, yeah. Elizabeth Tudor usually tops the list, doesn't she, Elizabeth I? She, 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 I suppose she is overrated. I, she wasn't amazing. I, I I'm, struggle I'm, with her, because sometimes I think, oh, what a me, and all that kind of clever politics. And then part of you think, well, Ireland was a disaster. Uh, she... I sort of think of her in the start of the British Navy, which becomes your greatest asset you can argue until now, but certainly for many centuries, right? I could be wrong, though. Isn't like Francis Drake rings a bell? Oh, I God, what a mate. And all that kind of... And that could just be a coincidence. It's not like she, like, ordered, okay, we're going to start an amazing navy that will conquer the world. She wasn't amazing. I, but I struggle I'm, with her, because sometimes I think, oh, what a mate, and all that kind of clever politics. And then part of me think, well, Ireland was a disaster. Uh, she sort of... She left the, she left the, she didn't solve any of the big problems. She delayed yeah. all the big problems. She didn't seem to solve any of them. So yeah. I, I struggle with her. So. Well, that's I, like how I struggle with John F. Kennedy, okay? And I always want to preface I don't know enough, enough in, in case I like say something that looks too confident and I'm wrong. But everyone talks about JFK as this, like, I've talked to my, my dad before about him. But just everyone I talked to, like, JFK, like, he's like, like, he's some this great president. And I'm thinking, like, 
are obviously he got assassinated. That's not his his fault. He only had three years, but um, our our position of power against the Soviet Union with with our whether or not you think it's wrong with our missiles in Turkey and no missiles in Cuba. To he he seemed to be his first meeting with was it Gorbachev? No, not Gor Gorbachev. Um, Khrushchev. Uh, that work Khrushchev seemed to be the bigger guy in the room and smarter. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the failed invasion of Cuba. Um, he was the technically the, the first administration to start the conflict in Vietnam. We all know how that ended. And so what positives did he have? Usually I hear is that like he's a great orator. Which, okay, that's not nothing. That's important, but... What else did he do? I heard, I heard he wasn't that great on race relations either. It was his vice president who, you know, eventually did the uh, Civil Rights Act. But just, like, what about JFK? I, I, that, that makes him, like, this top 10, top, like, five president or something. She delayed yeah. all the big problems. Didn't seem to solve any of them. So yeah. I, I struggle with her. So. Well, I, the thing about her that, that she that people don't seem to say, but strikes me, and it's a success of her brand building that people don't say, it, is she was just very, very cautious. Yeah. And she did, inherited the throne at a time where she was, you know, she was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, the country is hugely divided, religiously speaking. She was in an extremely insecure position Catholic and, had a, and had had a tricky life up to then. So I understand the caution. It's an yeah, intelligent person's nice. response. But she sort of knew she was on a sticky wicket and behaved like it, really. And she was, yeah, they, they are, ah. the telling the Armada went well, but everything she actively pushed out into the world was essentially underfunded. And Okay. So right there, you know, like the Armada did well, um, but that wasn't necessarily like I, I hate it. Like when we talk about presidents today, I'm not just talking about Biden or Trump or that like we, we so much want to score points with the other side that will say like, oh, well, look at this and look at this and stuff that just like happened that they had nothing to do with that take credit for. Nervously done. Well, and um, into the world was essentially underfunded and nervously done. Well, and yeah, she um, she underfunded the poor old sailors who fought in the armada as well, to their to their great detriment. So, well, she sort of launched her own armada, didn't she? Oh, yeah, the a couple of years yeah. later, that went at, we've, at least as bad. <laughs> we've got you know. that one. Yeah. What's our? Dare I ask? Have we got top three? Well, I'd have to. I think Henry the Second was pretty amazing. I think so too. And he held yeah. together. I mean, he most of France as well as England, and it's all down to energy. And also, he had. I think he wasn't great at dealing with his own family because the re relentlessness with which his sons tried to overthrow him yeah. does, it, to me, it suggests that he must have been a difficult chap, you know, domestically speaking. So we so, like but he's good. first and second. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering about well, the, the, the big two in terms of trying to conquer France are Henry V and Edward III. Yeah. They both tried with all their might to take over France, and they both nearly succeeded. But the whole notion of trying to take over mm. France is so ridiculous that can you count them great kings? For that? They've devoted themselves to something yeah. that was just, it was a horrible experience for the, both of the armies. Well, if they were in a tradition of trying to do that, and he did it still, and he, and he did it better than most, then I still think you can consider that, of course, it would be amazing, but much more difficult to just say, hey, all of this, it's, it's better to consolidate here and rebuild. But who's really going to do that, right? So if you're in a tradition of trying to conquer France, which everyone, like, the, the, they think is a bad idea, and you do it as well, but you do it pretty well, then, you know... It and, and, the, and the poor French... I mean, you sort of think about it, think about all these, the famous battles of the Hundred Years' War. Crecci, uh, Poitier, Crecci Agincourt. and, and uh, Agincourt, these great victories where outnumbered English armies destroy huger French armies because the French armies have, have got a ridiculous strategy. It makes the English the underdogs and it makes us feel all good and plucky. But the reality is all of this is happening in France. The reason the English are so outnumbered is that they have left home in order to destroy the lives, livelihoods, 
crops and villages of people in a neighbouring country who'd done them no harm. So that suddenly slightly turns around the whole plucky underdog thing to say, no, what they are is nasty, thieving bandits. And, you know, sometimes a burglar will be in a house and find himself outnumbered by the people that live there. But that doesn't make him plucky. I, I think you're setting quite a difficult set of parameters because you like... Yeah, I agree. It... But you shouldn't invade. It's kind of like a... Like a thug. Him plucky. I, I think you're setting quite a difficult set of parameters because you like a thug, but you don't... You, <laughs> well, there's you don't thugs want them and to thugs. Be, yeah, exactly. You but know. you don't want them to be... You like them to be sort of thuggish within a kind of national community <laughs> rather than invading the next door one. Yes, well, I, okay. I think what I'm expect. Firstly, I, 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 you say I like a thug. I yeah. think the Let's thuggish nature up. of government then was regrettable. Yeah. But it's all thuggish, yeah. so you can choose... The, the, the sort of bonkers thugs that you don't know what they're going to do next, the more even-handed thugs, yeah. <laughs> the thugs that fail in their aims, the more successful thugs. And so on the basis that they're all thugs, yes. Good way I'm to put picking it. the even-handed successful thugs right. over the unsuccessful capricious thugs. Fair, that's, that's I'd rather have a thug that has a clear plan than a thug that you have no idea what his intentions are. Very clear. I have a soft spot for Henry III, who I don't think was thuggish enough. But he, very... he certainly his worst enemy wouldn't call him a thug. You're no. right. No. The, uh, the, Henry III and indeed Richard II and Ethelred the Unready, mm -hmm. uh, the unusual thing, uh, a medieval king that doesn't really want uh, to poor, go to poor war. Henry the Sixth. Poor Henry the Sixth. And Henry the Sixth, he's poor another thing. one. But yeah, he, he was. I mean, he had uh, more problems than yes. that. You know, nowadays. We, we don't want our leaders starting wars. In those days, if you, if you didn't want to ride into battle, it's a, a big part of the job description that you're not willing to cover. What makes good king or queen? I mean, we, yeah, we, the, 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 the organised violence side of it aside, is there anything else? I, I, think that I think all of the things that we expect from government today, you've just got to ignore that. They're not trying for any of it. They're not trying for peace. On the contrary, they're waging war. Healthcare or like... In terms of education and healthcare, they're just, they're not interested. Forget about it. Um, so all you can expect is stability. That's the, the good kings provide stability, the bad kings don't. And that stability comes from being predictable in your actions and firm and not having favorites. And I think that's why the people, you know, I'm, you know, Henry the First was particularly good at that. He's even-handed. He didn't have a clique. The worst kings, the ones that caused the most trouble, uh, Richard the Second, Edward the Second, Henry the Sixth, have favourites. You were talking about kingship, like they don't have human bodies themselves. So I now, as I get older, I realise how different I am at various different stages in my life. Mm. And these people, as you mentioned, like Edward the Third, they're, they're trying to be Edward the Third. <laughs> But, yeah. you, you know, well, you can be Edward III as a young man, but then or you've also got to be Edward III as a guy crippled with musculoskeletal pain. And, you know, and yeah. I, it's fascinating, isn't it, how, the, how they, they age and then that changes the nature of their rule. Yes, no, yes. And I, perhaps we, we expect too much of them. Yeah. And but, but one of the biggest mistakes I think Henry I made was at the end of his reign when he uh, caused a rift between himself and... Um, Geoffrey of Anjou and Matilda, his daughter, who was, you know, his designated heir. And because he basically refused to give Geoffrey some castles that had been promised to him. And that is an old man clinging on to all of his possessions and, and telling himself he's frightened that if he gives these castles to Geoffrey, that that's going to start Geoffrey trying to take over Normandy, which I think there's no evidence for at all. But what he, the fear he's feeling really is of death. Uh, but he projects that onto his son-in-law. And as a result of that rift, that gave Stephen, the next king, the excuse to claim that Henry I didn't really want Matilda to inherit the throne. And that causes 20 years of civil war. And that's, but that's the product of a, the changing mentality of an aging man. Um, and obviously Edward... Uh, I think it's so important to always remember that every single one of these people... Like, just stop and, like, look around. Like, they were people. I say that a lot, but I think it's hard to forget that they're not these magical... It's like, no, it... 
Oh, why didn't he do that? Oh, he had a stomachache. Or like, oh, he had crazy whatever. Edward III, he completely outlived his faculties. And that... One sec, I, I, I got to pee really bad. One sec, guys. All right, sorry, I'm back. I'll wash my hands. I'm good. Uh, Edward III, he completely outlived his faculties. And that, that was a shame as well. He'd been... You guys have told me this so many times on different videos and different comments. This is Longshanks, right? Or is it the first? This great general and quite a good leader and lived his faculties. And that, that was a shame as well. He'd been this great general and quite a good leader and clearly an effective father because his Shanks. family liked him and had a strong marriage with his queen. But then she died and he starts to lose his grip and is very much in the thrall of his lover. And the country starts going bankrupt because he's still trying to fight a war in France and it's a very very sad end to a very glorious reign. I think wives are important and they're often overlooked aren't they? I think Henry I had a very good wife and Henry II had a remarkable wife and as you say but that like I think that the those are some of the details that, yeah. that we can ignore perhaps as, as tr traditionally men have written about them through the kind of military lens. Yeah. Or, yeah. And we don't we don't hear so much about yeah. the um, the queens. Um, yeah. the, the Queen's consort. Speaking of amazing wives, we've got Ella of Aquitania we kind of mentioned, but then Emma of Normandy is fascinating, isn't she? Married two, married, being wife of two kings. Emma of Normandy was married initially to Ethelred the Unready. She was his second wife. His, his first wife was called Elfiefo, and so he El made Emma change her name to Elfiefo. Uh, made things easier for him. But <clears throat> Jesus Christ! Anyway, when he died, she then married the next king, uh, but one, Knut. Knut. And Which so she was. Ordering. She's from Norman. Knut. Next king, uh, but one, Knut. Knut. For a second, I thought that sounds like an ancient Egyptian kind of name, but it's a, it's like a Norwegian name, isn't it? And Which so she ordering. was. She's from Normandy, and she's married into the Anglo-Saxon royal house, and then the uh, Danish royal house and her, I mean, her, her, her son by Ethelred the Unready, oh, ah. Knut, and so she was Elfiefu, and so he made Emma change her name to Elfiefu. That's not. Uh, made things easier for him. But anyway, when he died, she then married the next king, uh, but one, Knut. Knut. And Which so she was, she's from Normandy, and she's married into the Anglo-Saxon royal house and then the uh, Danish royal house. And her, I mean, her, her, her uh, son by Ethelred the Unready, Ed, Edward the Confessor, was a later king. Her son by Knut, Hearth Knut, was later king. She was a That's awesome. major sort of power node at that time and she kicks off the whole relationship between England and Normandy and we know where that led and so we, we don't have any of her words mm. we don't really know what she was thinking or or saying but she was right at the center of things and a, an amazing survivor um, so yeah that's it's a sort of sign that there are that there are powerful women doing things as well, but we're not necessarily as aware of them as we should be. When you're sitting there in modern Britain, writing away, do you think these men and women, did they matter? Like, I, you know, the older I get, the more I'm, what did it, did it, did, or, or is it all just science and engineering and, and microbes and, and do you think <laughs> that the people in charge make a difference? Well, I, yes, I, I, I wish I knew. They definitely, I'm expecting an actual comprehensive answer right now. They definitely make a difference in the short term. But here's the big question in terms of the period I've done. You've got for a long time in the Anglo-Saxon period, all the relationships between, from England are with Scandinavian kingdoms because of the Vikings. And you have King Knut, who is, uh, basically rules England and much of Scandinavia. And, and it sort of feels like that's England's orbit. Um, and then suddenly a, a few of the right people die and that all changes and William the Conqueror comes over and England's orbit is all France and then you have Henry the second and you know it's, it's almost like the whole direction the country's looking in swivels round was that inevitable would that have mm. happened if it, we know if Canute's kids hadn't been so bloody useless well, yes if he'd had more effective heirs yeah. or if William the Conqueror had lost uh, Hastings. Which... Yeah, do you th yeah, yeah. I've asked that before. Do you think like it would 
could easily have happened. Be much Harold, different. The Godwins is very much more Scandinavian looking. Would that would that trend have continued? Or oh, true. Wait, I'm wrong. I'm stupid. Or was the impact on England of Normandy and, by extension, France inevitable? That cultural power was a force beyond the control of any uh, man or men. I've never felt so dumb in pausing frequently in the past 30 seconds because he literally answered every single little thing I wanted to ask. So would, would without William the Conqueror, would the, you know, the... Anglo-Saxon royal house still have basically been dealing with France a hundred years later. Yeah. And you see how I've avoided ask, answering your question You're by pro. just reposing it. You're a pro. You're a pro. They, they have great chemistry. And it's not because I have a man crush on both of these men. I've avoided ask, Definitely not. answering your question You're by just reposing it. What a pro. I could, yeah, I could be a politician. I? I should be. Yeah. You wasted it. Best monarch to go for a beer with? Monarch to go for a beer with, I think. George the Third, so I can tell him that we won. Sorry. Young Henry the Eighth. Oh, okay. I think young Henry the Eighth, he'd be good company, but I wouldn't trust him. Uh, best monarch to be your brother-in-law, to marry your sister. To marry your sister? That's, I mean, that is an incredibly specific question. Yes. Now, it's, I'd like to have my brother-in-law is not listening. Okay. He's, he's not going to have life. to. Best, Edward the Fourth. Mm. Yeah. Bit of a shagger. He was a bit of a shagger. <laughs> but <laughs> tell you what, he did for his uh, wife's family. Oh, okay. He I'm absolutely I'm a shagger. <laughs> but tell you what, he did for. Dan, you're nuts, dude. I would love to go for a drink with these two and then act like I know as much as them, as hard as I possibly can. His uh, wife's family. Oh, okay. He, I'm fine. I, 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 a bit of a shagger. <laughs> I tell you what he did for his uh, wife's family. Oh, okay. I'm fine. That's a very good way of looking at it. <laughs> absolutely showered them with wealth. <laughs> but also, I, I think Edward the Fourth is slightly <laughs> underrated as well because so he was quite capable. David Mitchell's sister is listening to this podcast. You are, you are I there. I don't have a sister. Oh, well, there you go. That's why. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot of sense. She is there simply to bring yeah. honours and jewels <laughs> upon the rest of the family. Love but I, th I think they would, they would have said that family. That you, 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 I, feel like, I feel like that's been the case of marrying off daughters for centuries, ever. And an okay brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And then his little brother came along and had them all killed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> best one's gone a stag night team building exercise on a windswept island. Off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> best one's gone a stag night team building exercise. Stag night? Like the things that hang from caves? On a windswept island off the coast. Right. Now, what do you want from someone like that? You're on a team building. I mean, if, what you, if, if you're me, you want the monarch or... or Guide you to the latest pub that has the nearest <laughs> pub that has nice rooms, so you can avoid the Henry whole the team navigator. building yeah. exercise. And so, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe, you see, Edward the Fourth would be quite good for that sort of thing. He 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 liked his creature comforts. I mean, they killed him in the end. Um, oh, stag night, like a like a men's night out. But I, I'm going to try and. Think of someone, Richard the Lionheart. Stalagmite. Okay, yeah, he was he was good, he was good at logistics. Richard the Lionheart. Okay. There you go. Yeah. He was he was good he was good at logistics, and uh, yeah, I think if he if he was, I think if you could say, he if you well tell him it was the holy thing to do, yeah. you need to say we need to go on a crusade <laughs> to find the pub. Yeah. He, he, well, he did, did well on Cyprus, which is an island. So there, I guess. Yeah. So. Um, Dave Mitchell, thank you very much for coming on this uh, this show. What is the book called? Do it's more of these. Called Unruly. Unruly. And, only, and it does all of the kings of England from the Anglo Saxons to Elizabeth I. All Great of your cover. medieval kingship needs will yeah. be met. And it has colour photography. What? Yeah, although no photographs of the actual kings and queens, sadly. But that's because photography wasn't invented in time. <laughs> so, it's not my fault. Yeah. So instead, you have the dreadful drawings that were done of them by various medieval monks. Very good. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. David, how are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Well, it's good to have you. When now, you what? say live, this isn't live. No, it's not live. No, no, live recording. Did I say live? Yeah, it's well, live recording. Well, I mean, it's, that's yes, actually it's a... a contradiction. In terms. <laughs> well, it's but a oxymoron. We're it's live a... now, we're, uh, but as, we may be dead by the time people live. watch this. It's now live.
Thanks for watching this video on the History of YouTube I love you, channel. Dan. You can subscribe right here to You're gonna make sure love you don't it. miss any of our great films love it. that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it. <laughs> Man, I could, you, there is no video that I have clicked on so quickly to react to than when I saw this. Dan Snow, history hit video, Dan Snow, David Mitchell talking about history. My, my wet dream of a video to watch. Didn't mean to get gross. Love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. Would appreciate any comments at all. And I'll see you guys next video. Bye, guys.